Hello, welcome to Workshop Banter episode 3. I'm Keith. And I'm Matt. And in this one, we'll be talking about how to get and where to buy timber. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Hello, Keith. So what have you been working on this week? Uh, This week, I started a new project to build a desk. And I think it's going to be a start of a kind of series of videos to try and redo my office. Um, Even though I've only lived here two years and it's been redecorated and everything, the desk that I'm using is a little bit clunky and I don't really like the style of it. So I thought it'd be nice to build something for myself for once, which I haven't done for a long while. And to be honest, I've really been enjoying it, which is the first time in a long while, because I don't know if I mentioned to you before or whether I've spoken about it on the podcast already, but since doing a corner unit that I did a few months back, I just haven't really been in the mood for doing anything furniture related. I've kind of still been enjoying doing outdoor projects, carpentry stuff, fitting doors. Yeah, just haven't been in the mood for doing anything furniture related. But for this one, I'm, I'm really actually getting into it again and enjoying it, which has been nice. How about you? What have you been up to? Well, to start with, I'm glad that corner cabinet didn't totally break you. <laughs> um, now, the desk sounds good. I look forward to that because I'm going to need one soon as well. Because video editing and now podcasting, you need a totally different desk setup than normal people. So I bought back at the beginning of the summer a start right pillar drill. And uh, there's a few things. It's working, but there's a few things that wrong with it. So I've started the restoration of that. And uh, yeah, I've been painting that this week. Nice. Did you buy that locally? Yeah. Uh, Facebook Marketplace, which I think we're going to talk about a bit later on. Got it from there. About 100 quid. And the guy delivered it in the back of a trailer and gave me a hand getting it in the garage. So yeah, if, a lot of people with big stuff, if you just ask them, if, will they deliver? If you say, I'll give you an extra tenner for petrol in your time or something, they're normally quite happy to do it. Yeah. Is it one of the floor standing ones with the really deep capacity or is it kind of like a bench top style one? It's a floor standing one. And I've had things I've wanted to make for years like... Um, lamps that you need to drill a perfect hole through the center of a large block of wood and it's gonna um yeah i'm excited to do it and i mean think of all the jigs i can make for it i had that little cheap bench top one and yeah it didn't have enough power and uh it frustrated me i've wanted a big floor standing one for years and uh this is like dates back from the 1950s so it looks cool as well nice but i've gone for a, a cobalt blue and um a new brand of paint that I've never used before because I've always used Hamrite, but Hamrite I always find quite difficult to brush on. It's so thick, it's hard yeah. to get a nice, nice finish. But this stuff's really good. So I'm sure it's going to upset some people because um, I'm not going with the original colour, but it's my drill and I'm doing what I want. Yeah, Hamrite is really thick, isn't it? I, I've used White Spirit before just to dilute it down a little bit, but also I find it takes, it can take days to dry unless you've got the right conditions. Yeah, absolutely. This stuff, I think it's you're supposed to put the second coat on after half an hour and then it's uh, dry after four hours. But it's not water-based. I'll tell you what, let me get the can and I'll hold it up to camera and we can say the name. Genolite. Yeah, right. so I suppose we should say to some of the listeners, we are putting this out on YouTube as well if you want to watch us talk. Maybe even an affiliate link and people can have a look. But they had uh, nicer colours than Hamrite and I'm really impressed with this stuff. Uh, not paying me to say this but i'm definitely going to use it again speaking of machines i've been offered a deal on a spiral head planar thicknesser and i really don't know what to do for the best it's basically been made available to me at about a thousand pounds which is a really good price but the thickness planer isn't a machine that i use all that regularly it's probably something that i pull out once a month plus i'm perfectly happy with the electra beckham machine that i've got well, I say I'm perfectly happy. I find the dust extraction when it's in planar mode is really poor. I think when it's set up as a thickness, it does a reasonably good job. But other than that, I think it's a really good machine. Have you still got the Metabo version of that planer? Yeah, I've still been using the Metabo one. It's basically the same as yours, I think. I really like it. I think it's the best machine kind of at that price range. You you then jump up to a thousand pound machines or... The cheaper ones have uh, very loud motors and uh, it's around the £500 mark or it was when I got it. And I think at that point, it's yeah, a really good machine. It's come about as well at a time when I've been literally spending, I think I've spent almost two days just milling timber this week, mainly beach and sapili. 
it does a fantastic job with the beach. It comes out perfect, even though it's only the two planar blades. But when I plane the Sapili, even when I'm planing in the direction of the grain, I still get lots of tear out whenever there's a knot or an imperfection in the wood. And I guess that's one of the sort of key benefits of spiral cutter heads, which ultimately means you need to do far less sanding. That appeals to me and also the lower noise as well. But another reason that I don't really want to get it is because I, th I think it, I don't know whether this is something you worry about or not, but the more industrial you get with machinery, the less relatable. Yeah, the less relatable you are to, to, to YouTube viewers, which which is a bit of a worry. Yeah, I think that's true, but you've got a festival domino, so <laughs> you know, you're deep down that rabbit hole now. <laughs> I mean, with my festival tracks or... But yeah, no, I, I would love a helical head machine. The only thing that worries me is when I've used reclaimed materials and things and I've put it through and I've hit a nail. But the blades for the Metabo, and I imagine they're exactly the same on yours, they're about £14 for the double-sided ones. And I have actually been able to resharpen them myself just to get them back to usable. I know you can change, swap around four sides for the helical ones, but when you actually damage one they're expensive to replace and uh, I'd have to be very careful which I always try and be anyway but you sometimes find it or a bit of a stone or some grit yeah a helical head one is definitely on my list so one option would be if you don't want it just um, buy it and give it to me because <laughs> I guess those little cutters with the spiral helical head are presumably carbide cutters so I, I'm assuming they would be a bit more harder wearing than the I think it, is it HSS hardened steel I don't know I'm not really a metal person but yeah they're HSS blades I get um I've definitely seen people on YouTube and Instagram going oh I'm changing the blades around for the first time after having the machine for two years I probably swap the blades out couple of times a year on mine oh wow that's far more frequently than i i do i mean i i've had mine probably five years now and i've changed them once <laughs> oh really i use mine i would say on a weekly basis and back when i was making things to sell every bit of wood for products would go through it so it was getting a lot of use and and to be honest there was times where i was thinking i i could definitely justify a more industrial machine just because of the hours i was putting on it per week i would have changed the blades more if it wasn't such a pain i mean when i changed the blades it took me probably half a day just to set them up and get it cutting perfectly it's a real pain because you have to kind of tighten the nuts on the blades without it shifting as you tighten them yes it is a real pain and that's another great thing about the helical head one there is no setting up the blades are either in or they're not there's no no adjusting them yeah, that's the worst thing about it is the change of the blades on that machine. Those four bolts that you have to screw uh, in are really fiddly to do and time consuming. The only other thing that's holding me back is whether it will actually fit inside my cubby hole of my mitre station. If it doesn't fit inside that, then that's decision made as far as I'm concerned. I'm not getting it. If it does fit, then I've got some thinking to do. <laughs> I suppose we'd better get onto the topic, hadn't we? We've been putting it off long enough. Yeah, this one's all about getting wood. <laughs> <laughs> that has to be the title of the podcast. We could put one of those uh, emojis in with the... Uh, aubergine. Aubergine. Yeah, good. That's a good pure wild start. So I guess when you're starting out, the obvious places to get wood are the big DIY stores. In the UK, that's B&Q, Wix and Homebase. And... A lot of people will scoff at them, but it's simple. You can just go in, pick stuff off the shelf. They have all the construction timber, treated, untreated. And they also have bits of pine that you can make furniture out of. They do sheet goods and some have a cutting service, but they sell half sheets, which is quite practical, or even quarter sheets, or even maybe less, I think. So you can get bits in the back of your car. Obviously, the pricing's clear. You can find the prices on the website and things like that. You can go through and choose all your own timber. When you're getting started, there's nothing wrong with using them, I don't think. And to be honest, I still use them. Yeah, I do too. And again, convenience is probably the biggest factor with that. And there's nothing scary about going to one. We've all been to one. As perhaps when we get on to other places, they can be quite intimidating. Definitely. I've had some really good experiences with builders merchants and timber suppliers and some pretty horrible ones and i wouldn't go back to them having recently built a pergola i thought it would be an interesting 
thing to do to compare the prices of timber that I paid at my local timber merchant who specialize in softwood rough sawn treated timber that's all they do Um, and I got all of my timber from there they've got a really good selection of you can get timbers up to 5.1 meters in length right down to 1.8 meters in length and every standard size that you could imagine. The total cost of the timber from my local supplier was £134.27. I went onto Wix's website to to price this up, Um, and obviously the grading of timber is slightly different at Wix because the timber there tends to be planed all round, um, whereas the stuff that I get is rough sawn. So you could argue that the stuff from Wix is better. I'd certainly prefer to work with plane all round anyway. The one exception is the 4x4 posts, which they only do in sawn. The rest of the boards were all planed all round, treated. And the total cost, do you want to have a guess at uh, how much in uh, percentage it was higher? Oh, 20% higher. Yeah, see, I would have guessed about that. I might have gone 30%. It was 101% higher. (laughs) (laughs) Because wicks don't do longer lengths, for some of the boards I had to buy multiple 2.4 metre lengths instead of one 4.8 metre length, for example. So it's not an exact sort of apples to apples comparison, but it came out at £270.50 pence which is 101% higher than my local timber merchant. I thought that was absolutely astounding. Um, I then went on to B&Q to have a look uh, to see what their prices were like. And I actually couldn't do it because they don't sell um, 150 by 47 mil timber in pressure treated. They only do it in construction timber. And another thing that came out of when I was looking at the the price comparisons was just how awful the Wix and B&Q websites are for actually finding timber. Yes, they are. So even though the pressure-treated timber was way more expensive in Wix and B&Q, I think if you were to compare prices of things like plywood or construction timber, I don't think you would see that big a difference at all. A lot of people say that timber merchants are actually cheaper, but again, you don't know what level of trade discount they're getting and how often they're shopping with that supplier. Certainly in my experience, I haven't had much cheaper prices when going to a timber merchant or building supplier compared with a DIY store. If anything, it's usually been more expensive. But you might get a much higher grade of plywood when you go to a timber merchant or a building supplier. I imagine uh, home base, you'd have the same problem because their selection of timber is probably the worst of the three. Definitely, yeah. They've they've got the least. Um, I didn't even look at home base to be honest. Um, the last time I went to my local home base, it was Bunnings. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> yes, they they tried it for one year and it was a total failure for them, which I thought was a shame because they had a great timber selection, the best tool selection I've ever seen in a shop, but it didn't work for them. Yeah, I remember going into the Bunnings once to get some, I think I got three or four sheets of 18 mil hardwood plywood and it was it was cheaper than everywhere else and it was decent quality as well. It wasn't that bad at all. So that's amazing with the prices, but the good thing with it is you can go online and check. As with the builds merchants, you probably have to go in there with your list and you almost feel while you're in there, you're ordering it, you're kind of committed and they could have said twice as much and you have no idea if that's good or not. So I guess what's good is actually you can go onto the DIY stores, price it up before you go into the builder's merchant. Then you have a rough idea of what to expect. Absolutely right. I, I often call my local timber merchants and building suppliers just for quotes, um, but I always get the feeling that I'm just a nuisance to them. <laughs> Hmm. because they're at the end of the day they want to be dealing with trade they want to be dealing with people that are coming in ordering vast quantities of materials they don't want keith down the road wanting two sheets of plywood and i guess a lot of tradies are not getting quotes they're just using that person whatever the price is they're going to pass on to the customer yeah and probably getting a hefty trade discount as well that's the trouble they don't publish their prices well some do online because they end up giving different prices to each customer depending on the volumes they want. So it makes it very hard to actually get an idea of a price. Now, there are a couple of, or more than a couple of actual national brands of timber merchant, the biggest being probably Travis Perkins and Juicens. I think Travis Perkins is part of the Kingfisher group, which is B&Q, and Juicens is part of the Wix group. Um, But they publish their prices, but I don't find them 
cheap whatsoever when you look at them. No, I remember going to Juicens. There's a Juicens in Norwich which actually has a hardwood section where you can literally go in and pull out from an offcuts rack, which is sounds really exciting. Um, it was for a commission that I was doing. I pulled out two lengths of oak um, that were probably about three inches by two inches. And I think I probably bought maybe two eight foot lengths, roughly. Um, I went through to the till, not having a clue how much how much they were going to charge me. And I think it came to about £78, which was a, wow. which was a shock. But um, I wasn't paying, so it didn't really matter too much. <laughs> the one good thing is they do do delivery, so... If you want a sheet of plywood or several sheets of plywood and you have no way of picking it up, I can't remember what it was, but I think it was like a £70 minimum order. Or in fact, actually, I was at my mum's recently and got something from Travis Perkins and I think it was there was no minimum order and I got some MRMDF and some bits delivered for free. So that's very handy sometimes. Yeah, and, and you know, me and you have been doing this for, for many years now. We, we know what we want when we go into these places, but it's still intimidating. And I, I dread to think what it would be like for someone who is young or, or less experienced. Yeah, some places it literally has a counter, that's it. And then they bring everything out to you or you drive around and it gets loaded up. There's no looking at things. Mm. And you've got to know what you're asking for. And there's a queue of people. You need to know what dimensions. uh, Is it treated, untreated, planed all round, rough sawn? And there's going to be people behind you tutting. I don't want to put people off because they're not all like that. And in fact, when I was in Hampshire, a brand new outlet opened. They were called Coomers. They had three or four stores. And they were really good, really friendly, really nice. Delivery drivers were great. And I used to use them all the time. And I'd much rather give my money to a small local business than I would a national chain. Me too. Yeah, and a good place will want to help you. And if they don't, well, don't give them your business again. Mm. So we were talking about how intimidating it can be to go to timber merchants. Did I tell you about the time when I was at my local timber merchant and I got recognised? No. So it still is intimidating for me to go into these places. The timber merchant that I went to is one where you kind of drive in, you wait for a forklift driver to come around and serve you. So I kind of sat there. This was when I had a tailgate on my old van. I lifted the tailgate up, sat in the back of my van, waited for the forklift driver to come, gave him my order. He went off, picked the timber, came back. And as he drove back with the timber, I went to get out of my van. My foot caught on the tow bar of my van. (laughs) And I just flew over and landed face first on the floor. And there were a couple of people to my to the left of me um, laughing at me. The forklift driver went, you all right down there, rag and bone brown? <laughs> and I was like, no. <laughs> Actually, while we're on self-deprecating stories, I also had an experience in the car park of B&Q. Um, I was doing my brother a favour because I had a roof rack. He wanted two sheets of MDF. So I went to B&Q, picked up two sheets of MDF. I was with my wife. They were on one of those large sheet goods trolleys, wheeled it out into the car park. I was about to put them onto my roof rack. Suddenly a gust of wind caught the sheet of MDF and blew the trolley towards somebody's car. Um, (gasps) So we both panicked, tried to kind of stop it from hitting the car. I really should have used the lock on the wheel, obviously, so that it couldn't blow off. But for some reason I didn't. This man as if from out of nowhere, just suddenly appeared and uh, stopped the trolley from hitting this car. He must have just been passing by behind the car. So he stopped it from hitting the car and he looked at me as if to say, you idiot, (laughs) kind of thing. Um, (laughs) And then he went, oh, I've just realised who you are. I watch your videos. It's like, no. (laughs) (laughs) I've not been recognised a lot at all, probably under 10 times since I started the channel. Um, but it just seems to happen that whenever I'm off guard or whenever there's an embarrassing situation, that's when I seem to meet people. <laughs> but back to that one you're saying about you've got to drive up and wait for a forklift driver. If you've never been there before and you don't know that system, trying to work it out for the first time is not that in, uh, not that comfortable to do. Absolutely. And, and the first time I went there, I didn't have a clue what to do. I think I stood in a queue of people because there's an office where you pay for the timber. So I stood mm. in a queue, waited for three or four people to be served, went in and said, sort of, you know, what's the process here? 
And she was like, oh, you need to wait outside for the forklift driver. And I was like, well, I've just wasted half an hour waiting for, for, mm. for you to tell me that. They're not places that are geared up for customer service, are they, at all? They're just there to serve trade, pretty much. Um, and you have to kind of force your way into to learning how to buy things from them. Yeah. And if you're in the trade, you've probably been taken there by someone else when you were more junior and you just know the system. An apprentice. Yeah. Yeah. Back to the uh, what the Americans call the big box stores, they do offer trade discounts. And I've got the uh, Wix trade card, which always gives you 10% off. And getting it is not difficult. You don't have to prove much. I think they wanted a business card and a business website or uh, not even that. You don't you don't need much a, a letterhead or something. So really anyone can get one. And then everything's 10% cheaper, which makes their prices a bit more bearable. But I think you were saying that B and Q have a similar thing, which I don't have. Yeah, so the Wix thing, you you can use that online as well, can't you? You just put in the yes. promo code to get your 10% discount. From memory, when I signed up, I don't even think I provided any sort of letter-headed paper. I pretty much just filled in a form and got accepted. Whereas the B and Q one, I think that was the one where you had to kind of prove letter-headed paper... I've got a trade account with both, but the the Wix one does ten percent as standard across all purchases. The B and Q one, you have to spend a certain amount to reach a threshold, where you can then get either five percent or ten percent off. I think you have to spend two hundred and fifty pounds within a month to get that five percent off. And I've only ever hit that once, and then I didn't buy anything from B and Q, and it ran out. So yeah, the B and Q one not so good really. I don't know if Homebase have got a similar thing. Yeah, I doubt Homebase do. They don't seem very trade orientated. They're much more interior design, or but they've not been in one for years. Hello, Keith here, interrupting the podcast just to let you know that we now have a Patreon page. At the moment, we don't earn any money for making a podcast. In fact, it costs us money, and it takes us quite a lot of time to prepare and produce each episode. We'd like to keep putting it out for free so that it's available to everyone. If you enjoy the podcast and you'd like to help support and shape future episodes, you can find a link to our Patreon page in the show notes, or just search online for Workshop Banter Patreon. Thank you, and now back to the podcast. So yeah, moving on to builders, merchants, and timber suppliers, which we've already touched on a bit. Do you have any trade accounts with um, with likes of Juicens, Travis Perkins? I've got uh, yeah trade accounts with both, which means you can see the pricing online. I think that's mainly why I signed up. Uh, I don't maybe things are different now because it's quite a few years ago. I've only got an account with Travis Perkins, but when I signed up a few years ago, I noticed that the price that they would give you on the website with a trade account was different to the price they would give you if you phoned up and spoke to them. I often got a much lower price when I phoned up for some reason. But recently, I think they might have um, ironed out that little issue because last time I called and got a website price and they were the same. So uh, hopefully that that doesn't exist anymore because it's not great is it for the customer um but but the best thing about travis perkins for me is again the free delivery um that's why i tend to use them even though their prices aren't particularly great when you factor in the delivery cost often they can come out on top yeah i didn't use them that often because i'm sure it used to be something like 120 pounds you had to spend to get free delivery and as i say when i did it a couple of months ago it was i spent like 40 quid and they deliver for free it was amazing I've got quite a few local places around me as well. Um, I've got a trade account with one of them. The other one, I didn't qualify for a trade account for some reason. I forget why that was. I pop into both stores quite frequently and they're relatively helpful in there. I think the service you get from local places does tend to be a little bit better than the larger chains from my experience. Yeah, and you tend to get some expert knowledge as some of the larger chains, they're just members of staff rather than people that know what they're talking about. Uh, I've been doing some fencing and I've been using a supplier like you have for your um, pagoda or whatever, how you pronounce it. And so they just do treated uh, timber. That's all they do. Super friendly, know what they're talking about, helpful, help load it into the back of the car. Yeah, really great place and good prices. But they don't publish their price online. You've got to go in there into the office and talk to people, mm. which can be intimidating, but actually they've been really good and I'll definitely use them again. Yeah, I find that with my local place as well. The knowledge of products is really good. I remember having, I think, an issue with some guttering at my old house and I literally took in um, this unusual part, 
couldn't find it in any shop or online or anything this guy took it to the back and came out with exactly the same part that i needed which was which was brilliant yes you wouldn't get that in the b&q and wix in fact a lot of times i've gone in b&q and wix and i've been wearing my work boots and you know those trousers with knee pads and lots of pockets and people have stopped me on numerous occasions and asked me questions <laughs> and they've even stopped me when they've been talking to a member of b&q staff and i've gone oh no you, you don't want that you want this bit it's quite funny <laughs> and i don't think you even get that level of knowledge in the juicens and the travis perkins if it's not a product that they stock then they're not really interested no exactly and i guess they don't get asked those questions that often because people just walk in knowing what they want Mm. so they're not geared up to actually dealing with people's customers inquiries what about timber merchants matt what have you have you found any exciting um, places that sell exotic timbers or anything in in your part of the world yeah i've got a nice timber merchant just up the road and again they don't publish their prices so you've got to actually talk to them which is fine they will do delivery and one of the nice things um because i followed them i can't remember on facebook or on instagram and i saw their post they, they posted things up about their um scrap pile not not scrap off cut pile so they had a little section and they kind of marketed it for wood turners and hobbyists so they were actually trying to encourage that trade because the trades people don't want small lengths it's a pain but they've got them and the hobbyists that's absolutely what they want they don't want to buy a hundred pounds worth of wood if you're making a small box you want a few little pieces so it's great for them to get rid of it and it's great for people like us to go and get small quantities yeah that sounds great in norwich there's uh there's a few places but because of my nature i tend to just buy all of my wood either from reclamation yards or facebook marketplace and i've got such a stash of it now that i just never really need to go out and buy any unless there's some sort of commission or piece of work that i need to do where i need a large quantity that i just don't have available i think i visited the the main hardwood dealer in norwich three times in six years and that's it what are the prices like at your place they're pretty good but I've actually moved to a sawmill uh, to get my oak from and I get it rough sawn and then I plane it down myself. So a 2.4 meter long length that's 28 mil thick and 200 wide works about 10 pounds a board. Oh, wow. I buy them at like 10 lengths at a time and they have to drive by me to deliver to someone else. So if I'm quite flexible when they drop it off, they drop it off for free. So that's good. Um, so buying rough sawn boards is much cheaper if you have the pretty much half price actually I've found if you can plane things yourself yeah there's a local sawmill close to me um, but they they, again they only sell pressure treated sort of garden timber basically for fencing sheds things like that people always ask me how do you find them and I don't want to tell people how to use the internet but normally if you put in timber supplier or sawmill and your location on your county they will come up in searches and you'll be able to find them i know that's achingly simple but it that's how i've come across places yeah exactly the same for me as well um i suppose the only thing to mention on that is if you're looking for something specific so for example if if you want an exotic piece of mahogany or something of that ilk not every timber merchant is going to sell that stuff some specialize in just softwoods some specialise in just pressure-treated garden-type timber. Exotic stuff and the hardwood is harder to come by in, in my area. I don't know how it is in yours. Yeah, no, definitely. They all tend to have some kind of website, even if it's just a page or two, roughly. Not not normally saying what their stock list, but they tend to list the kind of things they can sell. So you get a rough idea. And there are online places. Um, I've not really used many online suppliers because I've found... I forgot what it's called, maybe UK Hardwoods. I, I might be um, misremembering that, but I think their minimum order is like £800, something like that. You've really got to spend some money to get delivery. Yeah, I've not had any experience buying wood online either, um, other than occasionally I'll go onto eBay. So Sapili is the one for me. I, I, I always really like using Sapili. I think it's a beautiful wood. So often I'll just go into eBay and put in Sapili. Yeah, and you're giving examples like Purple Heart. If you were doing some turning and you just wanted one length of Purple Heart to run down the centre of something, you can go on eBay, find a bit for £10. They're going to stick it in a box that costs a couple of pounds postage maybe, and 
that's perhaps the easiest way of getting it rather than the time you've driven half an hour to find a sawmill and they don't have it so ebay ebay can find a lot of things and it's good for interesting stuff but yeah if you want to buy 2.4 meter long lengths of boards the postage is going to cost so much and same with any online merchant you look at things and think oh that's not a bad price but as soon as you've added your basket and put delivery of a basically being put on a pallet that's 70 100 pounds delivery straight away so it's makes it very expensive yeah unless you're buying in huge quantities it just doesn't work out does it no but i have to say doing that i found a hardwood dealer that was half an hour away from me by finding their store on ebay and then i went down to his lock up and bought directly from him so you can use it to find people If you do a search on eBay and then you can filter it by nearest first and find people that are local to you selling things. Yeah, I've used that quite a lot as well. Reclamation yards like you, I used to go to one in Hampshire that had a lot of um, old pine floorboards and even some oak flooring and bits. But I didn't find it cheap at all, actually. I found it pretty much as expensive as getting new wood. You're just... If you like the idea of using old wood, it was good. But it definitely wasn't cheap. But then... I've seen them working, getting the nails out of things. It it takes a lot of time to prepare wood to sell. Yeah, um, the reclamation yard that I used to use is no longer there, unfortunately. But when it was there, they had a large sort of internal area where they did all of their cutting. And they had they just had this pile of offcuts and there was beautiful pieces of timber in there. I remember the last time I went there, there were pieces of purple heart and all of this lovely stuff. Yeah, the experience I had, again, was you, you would pull stuff out and go and go and ask, you know, how much for this piece? And, and you'd either be pleasantly surprised at how cheap it was or shocked at how expensive it was. Um, it didn't really seem to have much rhyme or reason to it, the pricing. And that's the trouble with the board foot pricing. It's mm. it's so hard to work out yourself or they don't even say and you've just got to put a pile together and ask how much it is and But they had some interesting stuff. And if you needed doors and things, my one had a room full of doors and bits like that and interesting hardware. And I like using that kind of stuff. But I suppose the thing that's similar is um, wood recycling projects. Do you have one of those near you? I wish I could say we did, but we don't have anything like that anywhere near where I am, unfortunately. No, that's a surprise because they're they're all over the country. I've got one near me in Durham. They do classes there and things as well. They do beginners woodworking classes, which we could have spoke about that last time, actually. And I totally forgot about that until I said it. But I um, went along and did a, a crackle glaze class where you put the paint on and it all cracks like um, the glaze on an old plate. It was quite interesting. On timber? On timber, yeah. Wow. I went there when I first moved here to thinking, oh, I could get all the materials to build the workshop. And they had all the uh, three by twos in a bin. A kind of standard length is 2.4 metres, but they're missing a foot or two because they've been donated and they've got some holes in where bits have been drilled through them and they've got bits of paint on them and they're twisted. And they wanted like £2.60 a length. And at the time, you could get them from Wix for £2.40 brand new. And I found that with everything. I, I... I wanted some oak. I went in there and they had one bit of oak one time. And it was a big old piece that would make a great mantle. And I was thinking, okay, buying that green, kind of a sleeper size, maybe five foot long, would probably be 40 or 50 pounds green. Dried, it'd probably be twice that, 80 or 90 pounds. You won't believe what he said he wanted for it. 400 quid. What? Did it have a lot of character in the grain or anything? Not particularly character in the grain, but it was it was old. It was out of an old building. But I wanted to be out of the Cutty Sark for that or something. <laughs> the Mary Rose. £400 for a five-foot-long bit of wood. Just a bit of oak. So I've always found their pricing to be unbelievable. What they do have, or my local one had, was quite a lot of old bits of furniture. And they were much more realistic. Like they've got some old chairs that are a bit rattly for five or six pounds great the wood in that is worth it alone but if you want to do it up but i've been in the one in st albans as well and i'd say the pricing again was you're paying more for you stuff they got for free more than you'd get it brand new uh, which doesn't make any sense to me like you'd see scaffold boards okay this is going back a few years because obviously prices have gone up hugely but 2.4 meter long scaffold board they'd want 18 pounds for but you could buy them brand new for 12 pounds and i know a lot of the point is people want them looking old and rustic but they weren't that old um 
uh, so it's interesting. But the, the St Albans one had a lot of um, live edge wood. So some really nice pieces of hardwood as well that were new. So that was good for that. That's such a shame. And I've heard on some woodworking forums that, that people do get really good deals. So I guess it depends where you are in the country and how lucky you are. Yeah, maybe I've just had... Well, not I wouldn't say bad experiences because I like the Darwin one. They're always really friendly people. And I've bought things from them because it's a charity and I want to support them. And they do classes for out-of-work people, turning, teaching them woodworking. And I, I, I like all that, but... I can't afford to pay more than what it costs brand new for something they've literally been given for free. I did a video a while back actually about um, getting wood <laughs> and uh, Facebook Marketplace was, was kind of one of my key places to go and find things. Um, but I think a lot of having success on Facebook Marketplace relies on using the right search terms because I think if you just go onto Facebook Marketplace and put wood in or timber or something as generic as that, you are going to get some results, but the results are going to be quite varied. You're going to get firewood, you're going to get wooden pieces of furniture. I still put in wood and timber occasionally, but I'll also put in more specific um, search terms like oak, mahogany, sapili, beech, whatever it is that I want to find. I found the algorithm works well as well because I look at a lot of old machinery and as soon as you start looking at it, it starts giving you that. So, um, yeah, as soon as you start looking at bits of wood, they're going to come up in your feed more. Yeah. But our terminology is probably going to be out of date by the time this podcast released as well because I saw that Facebook have just changed their name. It's a meta, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it's meta marketplace. I didn't realise that when your business starts to get a bad reputation, all you need to do is change your name. It's good to know for future reference. <laughs> <laughs> My approach to finding wood has always been reliant on having storage space. And I realise that that's a bit of a luxury. My situation now, I've, I've obviously got quite a lot of storage space. I've got a timber rack that's huge. I can store timber and that that's how I prefer to do it but back when I lived in a small terraced house I actually rented a garage I think I paid 50 pounds per month to rent this garage out and it was just full of salvaged timber that I had acquired mainly from places like Facebook marketplace gum tree some of it I paid for some of it I picked up for free some of it was listed as firewood but for me, I'd much rather just drive for 10 minutes to a storage lockup and pick up timber that I've salvaged over the last few years that I can then use in a project rather than go out to a shop and buy some. That's just the way I am. But obviously, it's not going to be an option for everyone to spend £50 on a storage lockup every month. Yeah, I think I've been the same. I've got wood when it's become available rather than I need it. I don't start a, or plan a project and then go and get materials. I try and have a good selection on hand. And I also find that inspiring. When I'm starting a project, I go and look at what I've got and what I can use. And yeah. often my plan were to change depending on what I've got. And a lot of the time, I think the idea becomes better because of the wood I have. That's a really good point. Yeah. But storing wood is also great because you can buy green wood as well, which I often see on Facebook Marketplace. People that have got chainsaw mills and milling stuff up themselves, you can get things very cheaply, but you're going to have to store it for a couple of years before it's usable. Also, I guess on Facebook, you can build um, relationships with people as uh, you buy something and then they're going to have more things and maybe in future they'll just message you directly. And I I've done that with um, my wood chippings getting rid of them from the planar thicknesser i put them up on facebook free to collect now i've got a guy that keeps um ferrets that i've got his phone number i just drop him a text message when i got a couple of bags he turns up and picks them up yeah a while back when i was um building furniture out of scaffold boards i found a guy that basically picks them up from london and sells them locally to me uh and i've i've still i'm still in touch with him whenever i need scaffold boards he's my go-to person I, it's strange, I've got a um, scaffold board guy as well, and all he does is sell scaffold boards. You wouldn't think it's such a big industry, but clearly it is. So yeah, Facebook Marketplace is brilliant. And if you want any more tips, check out my video on YouTube. I think it's called How to Find Timber or something along those lines. But hopefully there should be some good tips in there. Yeah, great plug. <laughs> What about pallets, Matt? When was the last time you built anything out of pallets? Uh, oh, I built a bar in the summer, I think, 
just because um, I had some pallets. I, th- I can't remember why. I, I guess it's um, with the old bits of machinery. I had some delivered on pallets. And then well, I've got them. I've got to use them. Um, a lot of people look down on pallets. I quite like the look of pallets. I think it's as a look, it's getting very played out. It's overdone. But if you're getting started, it's an expensive hobby, woodworking. Or it certainly can be. But wood is expensive, especially now. Wood is incredibly expensive. So if you can get it for free, that's great. Again, I, I get asked quite a lot, where do you get your pallets from? Any industrial um, site is going to be full of pallets. You, you want to ask. I had um, near me, again in Hampshire, this uh, printers. One of those places that small printing um Unit that you know, they used to have a copy shop in town and just uh, decided to move to the out of town and uh, do printing. So all their reams of paper would come on big pallets. They would put them out by the bin. I went in and spoke to them. They were like, oh, yeah, just take them. I was like, do I need to ask every time? And they're like, no, just take them wherever you want them. So I used to wait to the evenings when no one knew what it was about. So I could just reverse the car down to the bins, load up free pallets whenever I wanted. And another place that used to make motorbike accessories, they used to get all their metal and even bikes delivered. Now they used to reuse their pallets to ship things out, but any that were broken, they'd throw on a pile. They had a unit in a farm. So they had a, a big pile and every kind of three months they'd have a bonfire. So they said, any of them you can take. It's less for them to have to get rid of and something that's genuinely going to get burnt, I can reuse. So that was perfect. So I've never had any problems finding pallets. Yeah, m- most companies pay to dispose of them as well. Although saying that, I have had situations where I've asked if I can take some pallets and they said no because they're not allowed to. So I don't know why that was, but nine times out of 10, I think the answer is usually going to be yes. Oh, I think so. And I'm sure lots of people go and collect them without asking. But I've always asked because, well, I don't want any trouble. They've all got security cameras. It's, it's, most people say yes, so you might as well ask. Yeah. I've got a friend who works in, he basically works with pumps, but he also does electrical and plumbing. Um, but his company has not only more pallets than they can get rid of, but also they have these things called pallet collars. They're kind of big, chunky probably 30 mil thick bits of timber by probably 150-ish millimetres with big metal brackets on each corner. From those, I've had some really nice pieces of timber. I think the last one I had was poplar. Um, Lovely, lovely piece of timber and, again, uh, totally free. I see um, Paul Jackman and he's got all these different species of timber off the pallets, but most are just pine. Yeah. Yeah. I think the best ones I've ever had are the ones that plasterboard comes on because they're you know, really long lengths and they're put on with the shortest nails because you get those big staples or the ring shanked nails and the, or the bent over ends and oh, they're, they're impossible to get apart. Yeah. As these, these ones, just the nails went like 10 mil into the wood below and you just you could just pull them off by your hand really they were great yeah i've had a couple of um palettes that i think were maranti kind of like a pale hardwood with some weird pink colorings to it that was quite interesting i think i made a jewelry box out of those on my channel at one point um but yeah they're all predominantly low grade softwood fast grown pine spruce aren't they yeah i guess ones that move around europe are always going to be pine but Maybe things will change now. We're going to be uh, trading more with New Zealand and Australia. Maybe we're going to get some more exotic woods. Yeah, I guess we should probably say the whole safety aspect as well. There's lots of things to look out for with pallets. And there's some good information on the internet about which ones are safe to use and which ones aren't. Obviously, don't go making a chopping board out of a pallet that's had some nasty toxic chemicals on it. Yeah, I think uh, I don't use pallets in my house much, really. I think it's it's mainly garden projects I've used them for. But yeah, everyone, uh, it's your own responsibility to check what it is before you use it. That's another thing when I've had wood delivered, they often put the wood on scrap bits of wood so it's not touching the bed of the lorry. And yeah. often you go, oh, do you want that wood? And they're pleased to get rid of it. And don't want to have to take it, strap it down and take it back to the yard. So if there's anything kind of loose on the lorry when you get things delivered uh, or any kind of van, they're normally really pleased to give it to you. Yeah, often they'll offer it to me as well, which I always get really excited about. I've got two full sheets of MDF in storage at the moment that um, 118 mil, 112 mil, 
one of them's MR MDF as well, so that would have been quite expensive to buy, probably 40 or 50 pounds. And it's got a couple of footprints on it, but those will soon sand off. Uh, pallets also, Facebook's always got pallets free to collect. People just, if someone's got something delivered on a pallet, most people don't know how they're going to get rid of it. Yeah, I've seen people charge for them as well on Facebook Marketplace, five pound per pallet. Yeah, and I'm sure people buy them. Yeah. Because if you look on eBay, you can buy packs of pallet slats and they're amazingly expensive. But it is quite a lot of work to actually denail them. Oh, definitely, yeah. Where I used to live in Norwich, it was brilliant because you could just walk down a few alleyways in a residential area and you would find all sorts of stuff. Pieces of furniture, doors, all sorts of things. I kind of miss that in a way because the village where I live now, there's, there's literally nothing. I've also heard of people going to um, joinery workshops, companies that make timber framed windows and doors and asking companies uh, for their offcuts and a lot of people have had a lot of success with that as well you're going to tend to get your nice pieces of oak and maranti and sapili and stuff like that from those companies i should imagine but it's not something i've ever done no that's a good tip though and that, that reminds me a lot of it is making connections with people back when i um, was working at the pub as soon as people knew what you were doing in the pub there was a builder that used to restore timber frame buildings and mainly oak he's got a bit that's two foot long no good to him whatsoever you know an eight by eight two foot long bit of oak scrap to him goes on his wood burner used to bring them around i used to give him a couple of pints for a bootload of bits of oak i mean it would have cost hundreds of pounds uh and i got it all for free because (laughs) but it's it's knowing those people as soon as they know you're looking for those kind of things he gave me another lot and said, oh, I want a bird box. I'm like, no problem. I'll make you a bird box for a few hundred pounds worth of oak. That sounds like a fair deal to me. So, yeah, I think letting people know that you're on the lookout for things, maybe they'll think of you before they take it to the skip. Absolutely, yeah. One of, one of the best finds I ever had was back when I worked in my insurance job. And there was a chap that worked with me in the same office who knew what I did. And he said, do you want two panels of mahogany that came from an old wardrobe and I was thinking there's no way this is going to be mahogany it's going to be a mahogany veneer on some plywood I said yeah I'd be interested yeah that'd be that'd be good to see them sort of thinking in my head well I could use them for a workshop jig or something and I remember him saying it's an antique it's quite quite an old old panels and I was thinking there's no way this is going to be solid mahogany but it was it was a good 15 mil thick 500 millimeter wide panels of solid mahogany um, which I used to make a keepsake box for my brother's wedding a few years back. That was the one that I mentioned I did dovetails for. Yeah, best find ever. I mean, you watch these programs like Money for Nothing and you see the stuff people are throwing away at the dump. And you think, oh, if I'd have just got there first, yeah. I'd have had that. The recycling stores locally to me actually have resale stores. So when you're dropping off your rubbish, you can go into the shops and, and we've had some amazing bargains in there as well i've picked up a really nice vintage ornate mirror for 50p i think it was and then a piano stool i can't remember how much that was but everything's usually like under a pound which is just incredible really yeah there's some great things to be had but you see all the bits of furniture in there that like maybe an old wardrobe that was broken and it's just been thrown in there i think oh that's some great wood but uh, they're not as soon as it goes in a in a skip or in a bin they're not allowed to take it out again unfortunately which is crazy (laughs) pine bed slats as well Um, over the years i've made so much out of pine bed slats they're such a useful thing to have on hand and those are the sort of things that you often see in the dump as well aren't they oh definitely people are always getting rid of beds well i think we've covered the list and that is quite a lot of ways of getting some wood have you got any YouTube recommendations this week? I have, and I feel a bit guilty for recommending it because uh, it's not like he needs the help particularly, but Mr. Jimmy Duresta. I've never heard of him. <laughs> no, he's, he's up and coming. He makes things on the Rockler Woodworking channel as well, and they get very few views compared to his channel. But he's done some amazing builds. They tend to be a bit longer, a bit more in depth. And he does a voiceover, so you learn a lot. So he's just done one with a bent laminated chair. So it's about a 20 minute long video voiced over. And it's very interesting. And steam bending is something I've never done and really want to try. 
And uh, a few months ago, he made a Maloof-style rocking chair, which was stunning. And that's a project I'd like to do one day. But as we've discussed before, we spend three or four days making something every week. So I never have the time to spend three weeks a month just on one project. But that would be nice one day. What have you been watching? I've found a channel that I've really, really been enjoying lately called John's Furniture Repair. I think John's Furniture Repair is the name of the company. The person that's actually in the videos doing the work is a lady called Trina. I think she's Canadian. And I think John is her dad. But they just basically do furniture repairs, restoration and refinishing. The standard of work that this lady is doing is just incredible. Um, the videos are quite long. They tend to be about an hour long. But I find I get I get lost in them. Really, really been enjoying um, their videos excellent i'll check that out thanks a lot for listening you could find me keith on youtube by searching for rag and bone brown and matt by searching for badger workshop and you can get in touch with us at workshop banter all as one word on instagram or facebook or email us at workshop at gmail.com and if you'd like to help support us in making future episodes we also have a patreon page links to all of that will be in the show notes 